So I've stopped paying full price for books because it's just not economically viable and I think the ideal situation would be just to have like my Kindle and only read PDFs. It would be like the cheapest. I think it would be the most sustainable properly. Also the most convenient but that is just not what I like because I'm a pretentious English student. I like to annotate, I like to highlight, I like to bookmark my favorite parts and I do come back to it. I think it has a practical purpose and it makes me feel much more engaged as I'm actually reading. So the way I kind of compromise with myself to be able to do that is to basically buy all of my books from thrift stores or charity shops or a flea market. Sometimes I've done it on Amazon, but I try not to buy from Amazon. But that is usually a really good resource as well because I know not everyone has like thrift stores around them. And for example, if you want to read a different languages, it can be hard or if you want to read more obscure things. But yeah, I just thought I would show you some of the books I've kind of found at thrift stores. Some of them are from 2019, some of them are from this year, but this is sort of what I've accumulated over the last like two years. It's not all of them, but it is quite a few of them. I think generally a good price for a secondhand book if you're buying it at a thrift store is like less than a cheap coffee. The books I'm gonna show you, like the cheapest one was like 99 cents and the most expensive one is generally about three maybe four if you're like like there's an independent place really close to me and they charge a little bit more for their used books but it's like a nice place so sometimes you know I'll go a little crazy and spend four on a book this is a very privileged city living kind of thing but often I will walk past bookstores and they will have a big box of books and they're getting rid of it for a sale price so this one was only one and it's Mary Barton by Elizabeth Gaskell and that's Elizabeth Gaskell's first novel and she's a, a Victorian writer and I get along with some Victorian writers but not all but I've always been interested in reading some of her stuff and this is basically just about Manchester life in the 1840s and it's a powerful portrayal of a divided society and a moving love story in which she gives voice to the terrible suffering of the working classes. So because I don't really know if I'm gonna enjoy this author I think it doesn't really make sense to get it full price and that's kind of how all of this works it's like I have sort of a list of authors that I would like to read and I go into bookstores sort of knowing if I find this and it's a good price, I will probably get it even if I don't read it right away. But obviously there needs to be some kind of limit to that. And it's obviously not a good idea to buy a ton of books just because they're cheap and then never actually get around to reading them. Because obviously your reading tastes do change over the years, so I try to limit the amount of books I buy. This is probably one of the best things I've ever found. This is Decline and Fall by Evelyn Waugh and it's a special 1979 anniversary edition. And if you've watched my other videos, you've, you will know that I've really gotten into Evelyn Watt and he's someone that's very easy to find at thrift stores. And they had a paperback of Decline and Fall and I was like, I don't really like reading hardcover, you know, I do highlight, I annotate. I don't know if this is worth it for me, I feel a bit pretentious. But I was with my friend and he was like, it's the same price, this is a beautiful book, you should just get it. So I did. Um, and the only thing that's kind of wrong with it is that it has a little, I don't know if you can see that. It has a mysterious stain, which may or may not be a blood stain. I'm not sure, but I don't really care. I've already read this book and it wasn't my favorite by him, but it was also his first work. And it's basically, like the premise I think is funnier than the actual execution. It's basically this guy who's who gets kicked out of Oxford and then he, he ends up teaching at a Welsh public school. And that's satire about like English high society in like the early 1900s. Not my favorite, glad I read it. We'll read more of his. And the same day I found this one, I found Bride's Head Revisited, which is his Evelyn Waugh's most famous book, I think. And they turned this into a TV show, so this is like the TV show cover. And I don't even know what this one is about, to be honest, but I am really, really excited to read this one. I also found Delusions of Gender in the last couple of months. And I read this book in ninth grade because my English teacher at the time knew that I was getting really into feminist um, books and feminist thinking and he recommended me this one and it stuck with me so much to this day when I'm having discussions with people I will reference studies I read in this but it's been so many years since I've read it that I don't remember it well enough um, and because my teacher lent it to me I don't really have a way of going back and um, so I'm really excited to reread this and like you know see if my opinions have changed at all about it or if it's still as useful as I remember it being um, and it's basically all about how the difference between men and women are completely 
arbitrary and it's just a product of socialization which is something I very much believe and it goes into the science of that. This is the most recent thing I bought and it's Henry James's The Turn of the Screw and the Aspirin Papers and I had a lecture about Henry James and the lecturer recommended reading The Turn of the Screw because Henry James kind of straddles that period of the straddle. He's like right between Victorian and modernism. So apparently this is a really good example of a modernist sort of story. And so I was really excited when I saw this. I'd been looking out for it in bookstores for a couple of months. And I really like the Penguin editions. I find that their annotations and their introductions are really good. So I'm really happy with this. Then there's some books I got, I don't know, six months ago or so, or maybe longer. So this is Anne Bronte, The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. And I read Agnes Grey and I really didn't like it and I really don't like any of the Bronte sisters, but I've only read one book by each of them. And I thought maybe I should give Anne Bronte a fair chance because I know this is her most famous work. And it's apparently could be described as the first sustained feminist novel and it's about a disastrous marriage and a wife's fight for freedom at a time when a married woman was wholly subject to her husband's control. I think I could like this more than the other one and maybe even more than the other Bronte stories. So I'm really curious to see sort of what I think about this and I really want to get around to this this summer. The next one is uh, The Picture of Dorian Gray, which I've actually read. It was basically gifted to me. I got like a nice hardback of it and I, when I was like 14. And it was a really thoughtful gift, but I just, like I read it, but because it was so pretty, I never wanted to like annotate it or really engage with it. So I just kind of have completely forgotten what happened. This is also one of the cheapest books I got. So I sold my hardback and now I have this one and I want to reread it. And now that I'm a bit older, know more about literature. literature. Um, and now that I annotate, I really want to get around to this. And then a couple of months ago as well, I got these two, uh, which is Sons and Lovers by D.H. Lawrence. And I read Women in Love and it was a very weird book. But this is his most famous one, or one of his most famous ones. So I think in order to judge him more fairly, I think I should read this one. Um, so I'm definitely curious about him just because Women in Love was so bizarre. And I don't know much about this one, but it's apparently about this woman who's married to a minor. And I think then it follows her son and it's about emotional conflicts. Yeah, I'm just curious about this. Really also wanting to read this this summer. Basically all of the books I'm showing you I want to read this summer. Um, and this one is quite old. I think this was printed in 1948, um, which makes me feel a bit strange. I feel like this is almost too vintage, but again, it was really, really cheap. Um, I also got Love and Mr. Lewisham at the same bookstore. And I'd heard of H.G. Wells and I knew, I think he writes like horror? or something? Is that what he's most famous for? Not quite sure. I was sort of interested in him and then I picked up this book and I just loved the first sentence basically. It says, the opening chapter does not concern itself with love. Indeed, that antagonist does not certainly appear until the third and Mr. Lewisham is seen at his studies. I just think that is a really interesting narrative style and it just made me want to read the book and it's quite rare that I pick a book pick up a book randomly, know nothing about it, read the first sentence and go, actually, I think I would really enjoy this. So this is Confessions of an English Opium Eater, which is a book I didn't, I wasn't actively looking for this book, but I found it for really cheap. Um, and I was reading the back and apparently Thomas De Quincey's prose is witty, conversational and nightmarish. And even just that really intrigued me because I don't quite know how to picture that. And basically it's his account of, oh, I found a sticker in it. 14 ghost stories. So this is also so fun about um, secondhand books. Like sometimes you'll find the bookmark and can tell the exact page where the person stopped reading and when they decided to sell this book probably. So this person got stuck on page 48 and we'll see if I rate it and make it beyond that now. Yeah, it's basically a, an account of his opium addiction, which I really know nothing about. So I thought this would be really interesting. Oh, also I really love um, Oxford World's Classics edition. I find that the introduction for these is really, really good. I talk about that more in depth in my Jane Austen video because when I read Persuasion, I think the reason I love that book so much was because it was an Oxford World's Classic and the introduction for... And I also... I know no one cares about this other than me, but I need to like put on a bit of bronzer and blush in order to make that light not make me look like I am dead. Like I am very pale, but that light 
that's so bright it makes me look even more dead and then I didn't really blend my bronzer properly because uh, I just didn't usually we'll buy these penguins but I'm quite picky so I've been casually looking for Edith Wharton The Age of Innocence and I found it there were, there were multiple editions but it was a Wordsworth classic and another random one with no introduction and I just feel like I'm not gonna get the most out of it if I read that edition and I don't need it right now so I will just wait and speaking of Edith Wharton this book was actually given to me by my friend because he got it for super cheap and he hasn't gotten around to reading it yet. And he was like, yeah, you can have it, but just, you know, give it back to me when I want to read it. And this is the one I actually started the other day and I quite like it as well. I've weirdly gotten into um, this style of book, which is a bit like Evelyn Waugh where it's about high society. But this is about, I think, 90s New York rich people. I don't know why I like reading about rich people so much. And this one is basically about the stifling limitations imposed about, upon women of Wharton's generation. And she herself was born into like old New York society. And these three have probably had the longest. I found uh, Ernest Hemingway for whom the bell tolls in 2019. And I haven't read it yet, but I know that I would probably really like it. It's about the Spanish Civil War, which is something I studied in history and really, really found super interesting. Um, and I don't actually read a lot of American authors. It's something I'm trying to get better at because I want to sort of diversify my reading. And maybe not every book I read should be a Victorian woman. Even though I don't even like Victorian literature that much, I'm not even taking that module next year. But I'm not too worried about not having read this yet because I feel like I can see myself wanting to read this even in five years. The other one I got at the same store was No Signposts in the Sea by Vita Sackville West. She was Virginia Woolf's lover, that's why her name sort of stuck out to me at the bookstore. And it also sounded really, really interesting. It's about a journalist who only has a very short time to live, so he boards this cruise ship because he knows that Laura will be on it and she's a widow that he secretly is in love with. But I started reading the first, I don't know, yeah, I got around to around page 50 or 60 and then I just stopped, like, it went by really quickly because the page, uh, the book in general is only 150, but I just found the main character to be <coughs> really really grating and I don't think it was written well. It was very interesting even though the concept is cool so I was a little bit disappointed in this and I know she has a ton of other books. So even though I didn't like this, usually you buy books from secondhand stores. Sometimes you get like the weird book the author has written. So for example, D.H. Lawrence, I read Women in Love, which is kind of a, an obscure work of his I would say. Um, or Agnes Grey by Anne Bronte. You know, it's not their big work and I don't know if it's fair to judge them on sort of the weirder earlier works they've done. Then I turn this book around and read, published the year before her death, this haunting tale is Vita Sackville West's last and finest novel. So just because it is her last book, I'm a bit like, I don't know, it doesn't make me want to pick up her other books at all. And the next one I got in 2019 was George Eliot The Middle on the Floss, which I didn't like as much when I read it the first time, but then I actually ended up studying it this year. I really loved studying it and it really ignited like a bigger love for the book and I want to read more of George Eliot and I really want to reread Middlemarch because I read Middlemarch. I started it um, maybe in January, February. So basically in the span of that book, that was when everything went from being completely normal to going into complete lockdown. It was just a haze. Like I can't, couldn't name a single character now. And that makes me really sad. And, and I just think I didn't appreciate it enough. So I want to reread it. Maybe the summer, maybe I would turn it into a video. I don't know. Anyway, The Middle on the Floss is a semi-autobiographical novel and it's about, it's basically George Eliot, let's be honest, growing up in the Midlands. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend you read this because as I said, I read it as a one-off, didn't enjoy it as much, but to study it was great. There's a lot of Darwinian influences, which I really loved reading about, like sort of secondary papers on. And the narr narrative technique is interesting. Um, and the next one is probably the most expensive book I've ever bought secondhand. It was 10, but it's David Trickley's Brain Activity and it has his sculptures and his, uh, ooh, which I'd never seen before. I only know his drawings, but I loved his drawings. 
and there's also some like articles or essays on him and I'm really excited to read those um, and it just kind of gave me a newer appreciation like I sat down with my friend and we looked at all of the pictures together and discussed them and I think I'm gonna go through it again when I read it and like put a sticky note on all my favorite works just because like I literally my friend was watching me as I was leafing through this book and I just sit there and I just kind of go hmm mm. Like, it just makes me feel so content and happy to look at all of his work. Unfortunately, the drawings that are in here of his aren't my favorite ones. I think there are way better ones out there. But it was still nice to sort of get a better understanding of his work as a whole. And the best part about this as well was the fact that it came with a record and like a sleeve for the record, which as soon as I saw that, I was like, I would be so cute on my wall. And it makes me so happy to look at. So this is my copy of Paradise Lost by John Milton. and. As much as I say that I love the Oxford World's classic, this is not a good edition of Paradise Lost, I don't think. Because if you look at the... Ugh, hair. If you look at the line numbers, it doesn't have one every five lines. It does it randomly according to where there is a notation, which I find really annoying. Because I, I don't know, I think I'm just stupid and that really messes with my brain. And also, I don't think the annotations are very good. Like they're very short and usually only like one word often um whereas my friend he has the norton second edition and that one is insane i it's like nice and floppy it's big it has really good essays on paradise lost in it and the annotations usually take up like this much of the page because they actually explain to you sort of like the background and what's going on and what it's referencing. When I was reading or rereading this one for my course this year, I actually borrowed my friends instead. So, but I got this years ago and I just, it makes me like, I don't know, it makes me miserable and not want to read the book because I, I remember it being so frustrating. So I was in a charity shop and I found this edition by Penguin and I just find the layout much more pleasing to look at. I feel like the introduction is probably better, the notes are much more extensive, um, so it's not quite as good as the Norton one, but I feel like it's sort of the best I can get for a really low price. So I'm probably gonna sell this one or give it away if I can and just keep this one because I just, this, it just I have a personal vendetta against this edition. Then the other two that are, I feel really quite ashamed of this because I remember watching booktube videos and you know the person being like oh I accidentally bought this book twice and me being like how could you forget that you have the book already. So I made this mistake not once but twice because as I said I was looking for the turn of the screw and for some reason I'm conflated that in my mind with Henry James' The Wings of the Dove, which is a, the story of an American princess coming to Europe. So it's sort of similar to The Portrait of a Lady, but apparently it was later on and probably more experimental. So I got this one, which is actually like a really cute copy of it and also probably very old. 1965 so it was printed in, I believe. Um, so I realized, oh, actually, this is not the turn of the screw, but then, then at that point I couldn't return it. Um, but then this created this thing in my mind where I couldn't tell the difference between the wings of the dove and the turn of the screw. So I'm <laughs> genuinely embarrassed by this. I found the wings of the dove again, when I was like, oh my God, this is the one I actually wanted. I should get it now. And then I came home and I realized, so I'm gonna try and sell the, oh. Oh, it has the person's name in it that owned it beforehand from 1984. So I will definitely sell or give away one of these because I definitely don't need two. So yeah, that's all the books I got. Um, I hope this was semi-interesting to at least one person.